Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy, where we explore the scriptural, theological, and historical case for Mormon plural marriage. I am here again in this episode with my friends Brian and Taylor and my new friend Angela from Ancient Cosmic Clock, where they are going to bring us a lot more insight of what's written in the stars regarding specific things about Joseph Smith. And there's some bonus content that you are not going to want to miss. So I'm really excited about this episode. I do want to clarify this episode is not core to what I discuss on this channel. For anyone new to this channel, please, as I always recommend, consider listening to these episodes from the beginning or at least going through and get um, following which ones look interesting to you to understand the grounding in the scriptures that we have already gone over and the grounding in history that we have been going over this past year. But Brian and Taylor had offered in our last episode to do this work and bring it to us. And I think a lot of people were really excited about it. I also want to remind people to please um, remember the website, 132problems.org. It's a great tool for research, to be able to search the transcript scripts, to be able to connect, ask questions, a lot of different things. So um, I wanted to remind everyone of that. I also wanted to say that um, Brian and Taylor, along with Eli Stagg, have been working on making shorts from this channel. And they have a channel called 132 Problems to the Point that is putting some brief clips from some of the things we've talked about. So that's something fun to check out as well that gives you something to share. So without further ado, thank you for joining us as we take this really fun dive into what is written in the stars. Welcome to 132 Problems. I am here again with Brian Ling, Taylor Child, and now joining us is also Angela Nalder. I am so, they are from Ancient Cosmic Clock, and anyone who hasn't watched our previous episode that I think was our Christmas episode, where they, um, I, I, I recommend watching that one and watching this one. This is our follow-up. They came before and talked to me about the astro, about astrotheology and what is written in the stars, the eternal creation of God that cannot be erased by, by man, which is a beautiful concept. And so they before shared with me, um, I guess, do we call it astrology? Is that a bad word? People get so freaked out by astrology. What do you guys refer to this as? Well, we kind of, our channel's expert in more than one modality. Okay. Um, some of us study astronomy. Some of us study astrotheology. And some of us study astrology and the differences between them is astronomy is understanding it's the planet's movements like the science the math behind it astrology is when you are learning to read them and, and you've associated meaning to them and then astrotheology is probably better defined by angela how would you define astrotheology <laughs> astrotheology is just seeing the stars in all of the theologies it doesn't matter what it is rather it's muslim christian anything you can see how the ancients used the stars to help them write basically perfect yeah. okay so so yeah brian and taylor came i thank you for that definition angela and um shared with us the astrotheology of jesus christ and jesus's birth and what we could learn and they very strategically floated the idea of returning to do the same thing regarding Joseph Smith. And there was <laughs> resounding, a resounding response that people absolutely wanted to hear what they were going to share in that regard. So I think that's what we're here to do today. Is that right, you guys? Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to lay a foundation first, especially Angela, so to where we can dive into the scriptures, their narrative, along with the decoding it through the cosmos and using our cosmic knowledge to interpret those things. So, but I promise you it'll be worth the, the juice is worth the squeeze as they say. Okay. I'm so excited. So again, your, your channel is called ancient cosmic clock. It will be linked below and they, I just watched the video that they released recently about the coming times and what the stars can help us understand. And I, not that, it, not that it's a thing to like, I think like not to try to fortune tell or tell a future or anything like that, but it is useful to alleviate fear and to give some hope and guidance and direction. And, and anyway, I find it to be a useful tool to add to our, I guess, to our arsenal of ways to connect to truth. And so I really appreciate what you guys do. I think it's 
valuable. And I um, encourage people to check it out if they feel so inspired. So well, anything well, else? Thank you. you. And, uh, and if you don't feel so inspired, you know, no hard feelings. Like it's not for everybody, folks. That, that's cool. <laughs> I just agree. I think it's for everybody. I think <laughs> so she'll every, tell you you have to. Everyone should listen. It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> hey, excellent. Well, I can say I have really enjoyed. I, I have a very open personality, so I like to investigate new things. But I definitely, I, I tend to think if anyone, I said this all last time as well, but if anyone um, feels like, oh, that's evil, get that away, like that natural defensiveness, I really have come to believe so strongly that's not how God operates. I rarely see God operate through defensiveness and fear and having our anger. Not, not to say that there aren't bad ideas out there that we need to um, con 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 um, what, 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 contend against, although I don't yeah, like to, contention. To but kind of viscerally reject like... Or, and yeah, oppose. If somebody's, yeah, if somebody feels like um, this is getting into that space for them, then seriously, like no hard feelings. Like it may not be for you just yet. Yeah. Yes. And you'll get there However, when you get there. <laughs> the point I always like to go to is God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that means that if there are bad ideas, we can engage with them and then oppose them based yeah. on our logic, our inspiration, our right? And so I just wanted to propose that, that that's not always a good way to, to approach things. It's better to try to gain an understanding and make a decision about what's good about it, what's bad about it. And if there is something bad about it, then you'll have an informed way to exp express that rather than just fear. So that's my invitation. And you guys feel free to add anything you would like to. Oh, just that sometimes the people that are the most resistant usually become the biggest fans of it later. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> it's fun to watch. That was me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can relate. Okay, hey, yes. well, should I go ahead and add your slideshow? Yeah. yeah should sure, we start up the uh, screen share? Okay. okay. So along with that, that, that fear that people have, that's kind of what I want to go into to help those understand that when they see a zodiacal wheel, um, what they're actually just seeing is the path that the sun follows. So it's based on nature. It's based on what God has created. And to help people feel comfortable, I'm going to start with my Latter-day Saint background and how I started to be like, what's with the stars? What, what's going on? And that starts here with this beautiful picture we see of the Salt Lake City Temple that has uh, the asterism of the Big Dipper on it. So and if you look oh. right where my mouse is, you've got I that shape. I didn't notice that. Oh, you, you have it? Cool. <laughs> You're going to love it. Okay. Okay. So, oh, yeah. So th that is what really sparked my interest. And I noticed moons and stars and things like that on the temple. And I was like, go ahead. Oh, I'm just pointing out the stars. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're, it, they're everywhere. And so that sparked my curiosity. What why would God put this on his temple? What am I supposed to learn from this? So now do we know, do we ahead. know who added that to the temple? Was that in the original drawings by um, Truman Angel or do you know? I don't know if it was on the original drawing or not. I know that this, the, there was, was a drawing that had Saturn on it. There was a drawing that had the sun on it. I've seen a couple of different sketches, but as for the the Big Dipper, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, that's above my and, pay grade. I'm sorry, what did you say, Taylor? Oh, I was saying that's above my pay grade. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But I know it's there. Okay, yes. I've seen it. Got it. But I, again, want to clarify that what you're doing, the scripture that might come to mind for some people is worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And I don't think that's what you guys are doing at all. You are using the creation in order to better understand and better worship the creator. Is that, okay. is that yeah, an all right thing to say? Oh, yeah, that's a good, okay. that's a good thing to know that that's a concern to people because I can cover that. So. Any of the, so what I started to notice, uh, I'll go, um, I'll talk about that in a minute, but with the, with the Mormon temple, I just wondered why do we, why do we have that? Well, that asterism points to the North star and there's just this idea of like keeping your focus on getting back to God, getting back to heavenly father, you know, staying upright, um, 
staying on this straight and narrow path, guiding to the right place. Um, so that's kind of what spurred my interest. And then I also started noticing other things in the temple, like um, the beehive. And I was like, well, how is the beehive and why are there stars? Like I understood the, the industry aspect of it. But from what I learned in the temple is that God speak to us in signs and symbols. And even in psychology, signs and symbols are a really important way to spark things like in our subconscious mind, spiritual aspects, however you want to look at it. So what I found interestingly is that the beehive is actually also in the stars. It's in the constellation of Cancer. It's called Precipe, and that's actually called the beehive cluster. And right next to that is Gemini, where um, the Big Dipper is actually located. So it just all started to kind of line up. So that, that's kind of where my journey in, what, are, what is this about? Well, it was about nature and it was about God teaching me about him through nature, not to replace him, not to worship nature, but there are aspects in nature that will teach me about God. So Love it. As we spoke about before, it really does increase your reverence for the incredible, just perfection of creation, right? And it, I mean, yeah. it, it helps us see more elements and aspects of how great God is. Yes. Then I started to notice pretty much everything that was with within the temple was also in the stars. So you can see in Norma on the left side of the screen that there's actually a carpenter square there. Um, and you can see in... Circinus, Circinus, I'm not sure, um, but th that is um, like a compass or square. There's the, the triangle there. Just you have pretty much anything that you want to find scripturally or even in the, I think it's called like Brighamite faith or whatever. Even if you don't approve, you'll be able to see the aspects of it. And I think that's important just because it's going to help no matter what you follow or what you do, it's going to help you make sense of things. Even if Joseph Smith didn't touch anything with the modern day LDS temples, it still has ancient origins, even without Joseph. So just something to consider. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think it can be said definitively one way or the other. I just wanted to draw, you know, mm -hmm. like, like let people know that these meanings, I, you're correct that even if it was purely not Joseph, which I, I'm not convinced of, um, the even the ancient Masonic portions of it or the uh, the different parts of it, there are these ancient mystery traditions that go throughout time that I think are interesting to consider. Yeah, yeah. And, and these basic tools, a, a compass and a square, like you would need those to construct anything like no matter what language you speak what year it is what culture you're part of like these are essentials for building stuff so okay. it's kind of a a universal element like you need a square that is that is exact that is precise and you need a compass to make those kinds of measurements and to construct the, the shapes and the angles and the stuff that can that can bear weight and, and hold things up so there, it's kind of universal language and tools uh, that, you know, I think it was a Freemason actually who told me that. And I thought, that's a good idea. I'm going to hold on to that. Oh, that's really cool. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So time. now this is a really old map that um, a friend of mine showed me that I really love. And the reason I love it is because you can see the apparent path of the sun through it. So up at the top is the Tropic of Cancer, and then down at the bottom is the Tropic of Capricorn. And within that, you see kind of this S-curve within that. That is the path that the sun takes or appears to take across the sky. Now, here's where the thought about Jesus Christ and his obedience comes in. The sun is a perfect representation of Christ's obedience. He never, ever strayed from the path that his father set. And the sun is the exact same way. That is the only one that can right ascend. There's no other right ascenders. Uh, that's why the Egyptians called him Ra. 
Um, this course is predictable, dependable, year after year. In fact, it creates our year, it creates our day, um, and something called a great year. But so if we look at the map, there's a few points that are really important. If you want to be able to understand the cosmos or even nature in the skies, there's a few points we have to be really aware of. Those points are March 21st, which you can see there with a little glyph of Aries. The glyphs are in astrology, just kind of like instead of writing out Aries, we're just gonna put a little mark there to say that, that this is Aries. So, so the nature is kind of the language and then, then astro astronomy is also a language. Astrology is part of the language. It's all actually just one language, okay? They all tie in together. So March 21st, and then up at the very top where he won't stray behind, beyond cancer, that's like June 21st. And then in the middle there, that is September 21st. That's where the sun begins to descend below the ecliptic. And then the other point is December 21st. That's where we have all the Christmas holidays and everything. And that's midwinter. The reason these points are so important you'll find that all of our religious holidays are associated along this sine wave. So in, uh, at um, March 21st, we have the Jewish Passover and we also have Easter. And it's called the Passover because you can see that the sun actually literally passes over that ecliptic line. It's coming out of the darkness, springing into winter. That's the spring months, okay? And then when it gets to midsummer, that's where we have 4th of July and all of these other holidays. And then as it starts to descend down again to September 21st, there's other holidays there that I think we'll, we're going to talk about. Yeah, later. we're going yeah, to go into, we're going to talk about, talk about that later. Okay. But keep in mind those four cardinal, po cardinal points. They're really, really essential because they're used in the scriptures all over the place. Most of the scriptures, the writers, will start their writing. They will use those cardinal points as a beginning point for their gospel. Every single one of them. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's, it's, everything's built upon the cross. The cross is a much even older thing than when Jesus got hung on it. Like, so. Yes. So here's another so the cross symbolizes it brings additional meaning to itself, pre-existent meaning, which can help yeah. us understand why Jesus was hung on a cross because of the meaning it already brought. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Cool. Yes. So th this is for those that might be a little bit hesitant about um, astrology. Okay. This is just an old map. This, these are called gores. This is how they used to separate um the path of the sun, basically, into 30 degree segments. So there's 12 30 degree segments. And again, you can see the sun's apparent path going, going through that. They took those 12 and then they're showing like in one, in one gory goes through Aries, the next through Taurus, the next through Gemini, the next through Cancer. And this is a linear graph of what the zodiac is. The zodiac is just a circular graph of this, the path of the sun. So see, you can see how this is showing 30 degree increments through the spring up to the storm of okay. summer solstice. Not. So if you notice that they're all divided up into inheritances, equal inheritances, and, uh, and it begins with um, the consolation Aries, which is the first house. And that's a symbol of what the Lamb of God. It's with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that all the inheritances start to get divided up. Yep. Okay, and so I'm going to ask you my kind of basic question to make sure. So from our perspective, how this looks for us is how the sun is further south in the sky or further north in the sky mm -hmm. as it crosses our yeah, path. That's what the, we see. When we say the path of the sun, we mean like the path it traverses over the course of a year. So you'd have to be right. really committed to like observing the whole thing yourself, like get up every morning okay. and watch every sunrise for a year kind of thing. And so, and then it's also like the um, different 
star clusters or zodiac signs that it would be in based on where it is from our perspective? Is that kind of what determines the house it's in or the, okay, I just wanted to make sure that this was clear for everyone that they, that we all understand what we're talking about. All right. Yes. But it's a little more nuanced than that. There's different modalities that view it different ways, but yes. Okay. Yeah. Sufficiently like we, we got to keep it. Uh, this is not a Basic enough that, seven yeah. hour. This is not a seven hour course. This is a short discussion. Right, sure. Yeah. So this, so one thing I want people to understand is that the, the ancients saw the sun as in these different segments as a different vessel. And with each vessel, it kind of took on a different personality or a different energy. So in Aries, he'd be the lamb of God, you know, um, in Gemini, a twin in cancer. Cancer was also um, scarab. And you hear Jesus being called a scarab. Leo would be Leo of the tribe of Ju Judah, yeah, you know, the lion of the tribe, lion of tribe of Judah. Right. Thank you. Um, so, it, but you can go, you know, a, across all of them and see these different aspects of the sun throughout the entire Zodiac. And they considered it like an archetype of how they would describe the sun behaving in spring, behaving in fall, that kind of thing. Okay. And we can't leave off Virgo because that's the virgin, which is when Christ was born, right? So that's an important one to include that really should resonate with people. All yes. right. And it goes, it continues. Okay. Do you want to talk about this one? Um, just something, a brief no, note. Yeah. Um, doesn't super relate right now, but the, the, the trine is like a trinity. When it comes to reading the stars, like things have more of a flow as the Father, Son, and, and the Holy Ghost have a flow with each other. It, it's considered a good favorable aspect. And, um, and then the other one on squares or oppositions, like the whole sky is held in literal balance. It's held perfectly and laid out in a way where um, one archetype or theme is present and then whatever's opposite 180 degrees of that constellation in the sky is a, a constellation where that's opposite opposite themes and and likewise in squares or in quadrants um if you look at it in those ways you'll have like the whole family laid out for example you have the mother on one end 180 degrees opposite you have the father of the zodiac and then likewise you have and then 90 degrees opposite those you'll have the child and the partner. So it's 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 all the, the purpose of this one is to demonstrate that there's there's a balance of themes and there's a whole like how long is that video? Hour and a half video on our channel talking about the stuff on this graphic. It's a lot to throw at you, but just kind of a teaser. Go check it out if you're interested. I did. I did love that video. It gave me a, a, a better understanding to be like, that's a useful video to watch. Cause I kind of, I'm like, Oh, I kind of know what they're talking about now. So that's yeah. a really yeah. helpful oh. one. And um, I, I know I asked you this last time, but I'm going to ask again, cause I just think it's the most fascinating question. We don't really know where this came from, right? How this was developed or like, we don't understand the origin of this any more than say the origin of the story of Adam and Eve. This is just ancient right. knowledge. Am I it's timeless. understanding it's, that? It's essentially timeless. Your, like, your scholars will okay. point that it's very heavily Babylonian. Um, there's things in the book of Abraham that gives it away that he ha they have okay. this knowledge in the, in the Chaldees. But ultimately, um, it's timeless. It's, the, the, the scriptures okay. pull off of these themes so much. And so, as there so is it's knowledge that's so embedded that we have continued it it's it hasn't gone away because people have found so much value in it since the beginning of since pre yeah, that, is, okay. that is transmitted across thousands of years cultural barriers language barriers uh distance barriers like it's been something that has been important enough to people to hold on to and transmit across all of those barriers from the time of abraham perhaps to before to all the way into today. Mm -hmm. So transmitted perfectly? Well, no, nothing is. Um, Book of Abraham is one of right. my favorite sources on this kind of stuff, because that's one of those sources we have that's, in my view, pretty clean in terms of its chain of custody, if you like. Uh, Abraham wrote it, Joseph translated it, received the revelation, gave it to us, and that's what we have. We've got some reasonable confidence that we haven't uh, corrupted it the way Almost everything else has been corrupted. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion we could have about the book of Abraham. Yeah. 
And okay, like one, this is useful. One one more additional answer to like how old it is, like even in the Genesis chapter one is playing off, off of these themes where it says in the beginning, that literally says in the original Hebrew, it says at the head, the head of the Zodiac, the head of the Ram, that's a reference to Aries at the head. It, God created the heavens and the earth. We'll look at on the, on the, on the, on the graphic, Pisces is the heavens, Taurus mm -hmm. is the earth. At the head, you have the heavens and the earth. It's like the playing the off earth. of it, like right off the, at the start of our scriptures. Yeah, and I think I probably said this as well last time, but I think it's so useful that um, you guys are doing this because I think in our modern time, we tend to have much less reverence for the heavens than they would have had pre-electricity, right? This was your light source and you were so intimately aware with the the um, stars, the plant, you know, the, the, the signs in the heavens that this would resonate a lot more naturally than it does maybe in our time when we just don't even have to ever pay attention to the sky if we don't want yeah. to. Right. So I think I, anyway, I, I want to again invite us to recognize how um, how closely associated all of our ancestors would have been with the heavenly orbs compared to us today. So like, okay. this is how Continue. you know when it's time to plant, when it's time to harvest. This is yeah. how you navigate. Like, you know, you go outside. When you wake up, when you go to bed, every every aspect yeah. of all of it. Okay. Some, somehow farmers figured out how to farm without monkeying with their clocks like we did today. <laughs> yeah, they saw Taurus rise above the horizon and they knew it was time to plow. The bull. They saw Virgo with the sheath of wheat. They knew it was time to you take down the wheat. They know it's time to harvest. That's Winter's literally, coming, it was life everything. and death for them. They had to know the stars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something I have to point out in order for us to understand how the scriptures kind of re relate to this. So anything above the ecliptic was considered living. That's where life is. Spring, summer, things are green. Um, Garden of Eden. Yeah, alive. Yep. Paradise, that kind of thing. Anything below the ecliptic line after the sun falls, that's literally why we call it fall, falls below the ecliptic line. That's where they considered the sun to die or to go to death um, because that's winter. That's where things die. So above you have, um, that's where you live. And below you have the opposite. If you literally reverse that, it's evil. So to the ancients, they really saw winter as kind of like this, this evil thing because there was death involved. There was, you couldn't, if, you know, you can't go out and plant in December. It's not, it's, it's been cursed, you know, it's not, it's not going to do any good. So that's really important to, un to understand that. Um, so you have now, this. Was it necessarily evil? Because that puts a value judgment on it. It's also just contrast, right? Like yin and yang. Like it's, this is life, this is death. I I, I don't know that it would have had the emotional, this is good and this is bad necessarily. Yeah, is death evil? Like, well, no, death is part of life. Yep. It comes for all of us right. eventually. Yes. That's exactly well, um, The root word of good can comes from and has some meaning and connection to the word abundance. Like to have goodly parents would mean to have wealthy parents. So mm -hmm. there's the, uh, certainly above, it's good, it's godly, it's abundant, and below, it, that abundance is taken away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, but ideally we see, but ideally we see good in both sides. We see um, yes. use, value. It's not this one is our friend and this one is our enemy. They're just the cycles that are in. Yes. The, that you've, we done, you've done really well bringing up the yin and yang because it's not all the way dark or all the way light, it has another part in it. And that's, that, that was a good analogy. Well, this is also Northern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere is experiencing the opposite. Good, bad, okay. you, you see, so they both exist. They both mm -hmm. exist. So the points on the equinoxes, so that would be in Aries and in Virgo there, those were called, those had different names in the past. They were the two trees, they were the two covenants, I think it's important for people that want to be a covenant people to understand kind of where the beginning of covenants began. It began with nature, because what is a prophet really more than to tell the coming of the sun, to prepare you for the coming of the sun, the son of God? Well, you have these covenants there in Aries at that equinox that was considered like the, the covenant of works because you have to work, you have to plow. You have to work while spring and is there. 
And then the covenant of uh, grace or a covenant of faith was considered that point on the equinox in the fall. So you have the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, obviously, because Interesting. One, you're defending your, you know, de- like relying on faith or faith down here and then works. Mm-hmm. Works in the summer, faith in the winter, that the sun is going to come up and come again. So that's literally what the prophets of old used to do. Yeah. And your faith is no good without works. If you haven't laid up in store, yep. you know, to get you through the winter months. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that, that's kind of laying the groundwork for how we're going to talk about a couple of things in the scriptures on the way to Joseph Smith and our favorite uh, successor to Joseph Smith to abuse. So the, the idea is as the sun rises and the sun falls, like so do the kingdoms of the earth. So do dispensations, so does light and intelligence. And, and, and we fall into the darkness, like we go through these themes. And the scriptures are better understood with these cosmic goggles on. And, um, and the reason why that is, is God has, he's the creator of all things and he's embedded his truth in all creation. And therefore he's using those symbols also to in allegory in scripture. So we're going to look at Daniel. We're going to go through it really briefly just to kind of lay a a groundwork of, because we'll be better understand things if we can understand the past, present, and future. And as it says in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says truth is a knowledge as, of things as they were, as they are, and as they will become. So first kingdom, and Daniel has a dream. He has many dreams, many visions. Um, and the first kingdom, he sees a lion. And the lion loses its wings. It loses its power to ascent. Um, the lion is like a good symbol of the Leo constellation. And the Leo constellation one of the themes or archetypes that that encompasses is the idea of of power and and clearly babylon held that power and it, as it says and it and it will scriptures often will give another symbol to say the same thing they repeat themselves so if you don't understand something it's best looking at the next symbol and it says that he was given a heart of a man and if you flip back to the previous screen the heart is Leo also. The heart is ruled by Leo. So it's giving two different symbols for Leo, which is a symbol of like strength and power. And Babylon was given power. Not only that, in archaeology, um, there's a lot of lion symbols that represented Babylon. Oh, yeah. and, and it's also the kingdom that Daniel started with. It's a clear it, interpretation. It fits like a glove. And let's go back. And, and that was the Babylonian empire that he was seeing. And the next one is the bear and the bear has three ribs in its mouth. But, but once again, the bear is also a cosmic symbol. It's a symbol of the big dipper Ursa major, right? And it rises, it falls and here it rises. Taylor's going to discourse on this here in a little bit more, but it has three ribs in its mouth, three in the original Hebrew language, um, was a hieroglyph of a foot and and think of the idea of putting it underfoot. So it's bringing in this idea of this bear putting the lion underfoot, having three ribs in its mouth as for it went at its heart. It's kind of bringing up that symbolism of as if it took three ribs and removed its power, right? Yeah, the beast like the lion has lost its wings and it's had its heart replaced with a man, something inferior to a lion. Mm-hmm. And now the bear has put the three ribs in its mouth, it's underfoot, it's replaced it. Yes. And then okay. it's, inter- it's interesting that it brings up a leopard here. In the sky, there's actually two feline constellations, or, um, Leo Major, Leo, Leo, Leo Minor, and you could argue that the leopard's Leo Minor. Um, and previously, the bear was Persian Empire. They, they're, they're, they are what who came before, um, ca- came after Babylon, and they came before Greek, the Greek Empire. Um, leopard we would associate with uh, as a clear fit to Alexander the Great, one of the most written about people in history. Um, he died young. Some people think he was poisoned, um, but the kingdom hadn't been set up with a successor and it, it got divided up among four generals. And these like these allegories and how they overlay cosmically onto what actually happened on the earth 
are they fit like a glove they fit better than oj simpson's glove <laughs> <his trial. laughs> so um last of the kingdoms the beast was dreadful it had iron teeth it stamps out the others with his feet once again the idea of putting subduing the other kingdoms putting them underfoot being the new heir and uh he has 10 horns 10 is kind of an allegory for the sun. The, it's this big, beautiful, uh, scary monster looking thing. <laughs> Hope we depicted these accur accurately enough for everybody. But 10 in the original hieroglyphic form was, um, it was a hieroglyph of a, the right arm. Like think the right arm of power, it's a representation of the sun. And so they were given ultimate power and they were able to subdue all the, the other three kingdoms. Once again, that three, the idea of putting underfoot um, what's interesting about all this and what I wanted to put into context is when people start to look at these scriptures and they start to interpret them, they like freak out and they say, this little horn that comes next, it's the Antichrist. And they, they name Trump and Obama and everybody that's their political, whoever photo, you don't like, whoever you don't like. <laughs> and, and it's like, Hey, wait a second. It's a little horn. It has a mouth. Mouth is a symbol of Gemini. That's once again, the Gemini constellation when you track it back to its origins. And it's the idea of like a trickster, the idea, and this is a theme that you'll see reoccurring, but it's more of somebody that's going to be pretending to be your friend, right? Not necessarily somebody in open war and open rebellion. So mm. it says he's more stout than his others and he wears out the saints and he changes times and laws and is given dominion for a time. And it says, and I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He overtakes them. He took them over. Well, you count off the kings because it says in scripture that the 10 horns of the 10 kings, and then that one came. So it's the 11th king it's talking about. That's Constantine. He put together a council of Nicaea and I hate to break it to everybody, but he deceived the whole world. It already happened. Like he came up and re-changed the nature of God and Oftentimes Mormonism sees outside to Christianity and they see how corrupt they are. They're seeing the fingerprints of an antichrist. Yes, okay. these themes can come and repeat again, but the idea is, is like light comes and then it gets taken away. They, they go into the wilderness. So kind of what we're, what we're suggesting from this interpretation of Daniel seven is like most of that stuff has already happened and it's written in the history. And if you look at it that way, it fits better than O.J. Simpson's glove, better than O.J. Simpson's glove. <laughs> I promise I wouldn't do too many Trump <laughs> Stop promising. <laughs> hey, that's really, that's really cool. So, so the more we can, this gives us just additional tools to help us understand these rather of um, potentially obscure portions of scripture. And mm -hmm. so I guess it's the, the question is like, was Daniel prophesying of this exact time period that you're talking about with Constantine? Or is Daniel Daniel revealing a pattern that humanity falls into? And that's one time it played out and there are other times it plays out. Both. I vote both. both. Okay. <laughs> yes is the answer to yes. your question. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So it still is applicable in different yes, ways. But applicable. We, can see, we can see patterns. Okay, great. And we've got some graphics here kind of depicting the bears in the sky, which we kind of touched on. Yes, we touched about the bears. You mentioned Gemini as the trickster archetype. And how it relates to the mouth. Venus. Okay. You going to tell us about Venus? Yeah. Cinderella? Yeah. So Mate, one, one thing Cinderella. before you start. One thing before we start, um, before, before I turn it over to Taylor. Um, it was told to me from a Hebrew friend. He says, you don't realize that uh, when Jesus was on earth and you would hear these like parables he goes jesus wasn't making all those up a lot of times he was telling um people stories that were known fairy tales known children's stories and he would be answering yeah. people's heated gospel discussion debates with fairy tales so we're going to do the same thing because it was as if jesus said humpty dumpty sat on a wall and that's how he gave an answer right. <laughs> so we're going to do yeah. the same thing to you guys and we yeah, can, yeah, or like we the, can uh, even think of like Aesop's fables as well. Like I'm yeah, thinking right. that they were, because because even the fairy tales had purpose behind them, had meaning behind them. Okay. And, and if you just, if you read the gospels, you know, this is, this is the time of year when I spend, I tend to read the gospels a little more in the springtime, you know, resurrection, Easter. Um, 
can consider how often a question is posed to Jesus. Okay, it's okay, Jesus. Like I, I, I have this image in my mind of like a guy posing a gotcha question. All right, Jesus, you said, love God, love your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Well, a certain man went down from Jericho to Jerusalem and, and the whole, like he tells him this whole story. And it's like, you know, what, to your point, these stories weren't like, and then what happened? And then what, like they were, they were familiar. Um, okay. Okay. Interesting. I haven't heard that. That's interesting. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to use the Cinderella story a little bit. This is, uh, again, all of these graphics were created by our friend Brian over here. So I'm going to give him. They're amazing. Credit for I love these them. Big, beautiful graphics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Cinderella story, you know, we're all familiar with it. This, this ordinary girl grows up with this horrible, abusive family that's not really her family. And she finds a substitute family in the prince. Um, she's identified by her feet, and, the, and the, there's a lot of it related to, you know, does the slipper fit? Does the a lot of stuff tied up in the slipper. And the, and the reason that is, because this story goes all the way back to at least ancient Greek, possibly ancient Egypt. Yep. Oh, um, I think Taylor should paragraph. stop saying O.J. Simpson's glove and say it fits as well as Cinderella's slipper. Wouldn't that be a better one? <laughs> <laughs> like it. It, fits, it fits better than Cinderella's slipper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, the, the theme of this story is, is she's replacing her prior family. She's putting them underfoot, if you like, and going off to live happily ever after with her companion, where she can have a new family and a new start and a new, you know, I'm, I'm even old enough that the versions of Cinderella that I'm familiar with, that I grew up with, she gets married. How often does the story, does the princess and the prince get married? which is a covenant relationship. Nowadays, they just say, yeah, yeah, they kissed and now they're, they're good. But no, they get married. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, set aside and, and uh, depart from the prior family relationship. And that's, that's one of the themes in the sky of both the planet Venus and the constellation Pisces. Um, I'll talk more about yeah. that later. Yeah. So one thing to really, really know is when it's bringing up the feet or getting put underfoot, like the Cinderella story came from the same place. It all goes back to that Egypt, Egyptian hieroglyph of the foot, which the Hebrews adopted and put into a numbering system. So we're expounding on these so that you can understand what, what we're going to dissect in scripture when, later on. When I talk about the, the Revelations 12 sign, we, we teased that a little bit in our last uh, episode at Christmas time. You know, that, that was one of the themes, right? A covenant body being replaced, being placed underfoot and having a new covenant body uh, assume that, that status. And another example is the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Yes, so Little Red Riding Hood. So you'll find this very interesting. Every fairy tale, every single one of them can be found also in the, the path of the sun there that you were shown. They, they're all there, every single one of them. Um, the fairy tales were meant to teach children about how nature works. They, they, you know, they seem to not make a lot of sense, but that's actually what, what they were. They're to teach children how to know when to plow, how to know when to seed, what can happen um, if you go out after dark and the big bad wolf comes, right? So this is kind of what Little Red Riding Hood is about. So she... Oh, okay. Yeah. So she comes and she's in this beautiful place with her mother. So that would be up above the ecliptic where things are beautiful and bright. And she gets, you know, sent out. And then it get what does it happen? It gets dark, right? After, you start, they go into the dark yeah, forest. Yeah, go into the dark forest, right? It's, it's the known and the unknown, right? The the seen mm -hmm. and the unseen, the understood and the mysterious. That that. Mm -hmm. yep. But yep. also when it uses into the wilderness in scripture, it's the same story. It's yes. the dark I, forest. Jesus goes yep. into the wilderness. Okay. Okay. And, and, that's and so does Nephi and so does mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. All of them will go into the wilderness at one point. So that's falling below the ecliptic line into fall, falling into winter. So she does that and she's met with a wolf. And I think we have a slide for the wolf. Uh, yes, there he is. Yeah, the wolf constellation. Okay. Yeah. So this is lupus. And this is right 
as the sun starts to descend underneath the ecliptic line or little red riding hood in this situation and she gets met with the wolf and she gets devoured okay. in the darkness of night okay but then eventually she works her way out this is just a sum up version and i think the next slide is for um well i thought i had orion oh this point. one this one yeah okay so yeah, and then ones. we have over in um when before the sun comes back up over the ecliptic, we have the hunter or Orion there to rescue her from the darkness of night, the wolf there. It's all astrological. It's all about nature. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And like uh, Little Red's a symbol of, I would say, Libra at large. Like she's wearing red. Creation turns red mm -hmm. when it goes yeah. into the fall and mm -hmm. goes into the dark forest. All the leaves turn red. Yeah. Yep. When grapes get ripe and they're red and and grape juice and wine are made from those. I'm really hoping that's Angela's birthday with that beautiful red hair. <laughs> <laughs> she has, she's a Libra rising, so she is part of that sign. That's half of her sign. Yep. Okay. And I, that's, that's actually fun. I was just making it. And, and you're like Libra that. rising too, and you have red hair. It's a thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so Daniel 8. Yeah, let's go. Jay, is this you or me? I think this one's you. So at large, uh, the scriptures are prophesying off the zodiac signs. Um, I hope I don't start too much nefarious speculation, but uh, the Antichrist and the prophets, the, the um, the prophets were prophesying them based on their um, zodiac signs and Jesus being the Lamb of God, being born under the sign of Aries, right? And and one thing to note that when we have prophecies and rituals and and all those things that we enact, they're foreshadowing. For example, the foreshadowing of having the high priest in the temple um, kill the Lamb, and he's the one that kills the Lamb over and over and over again. And then the high priest Caiaphas later on. Has, he was the driving force behind getting Jesus killed. So it was a, a prophecy. So we should be looking at these things when they're bringing zodiacal animals in. We should be looking at them like prophecies. And oh, um, Interesting. Okay. So the summary is, is the ram with two horns pushes northwest and south. No beast could stand before him. The goat comes from the west with a notable horn, runs on the ram and puts it under his foot. We understand what underfoot means, but look at these as dispensations. Don't um, like Christianity was based on two, having two people come up at the sign of Aries, one being Jesus, one being Peter. Peter was very stereotypical Aries on how he acted. And thus the ram has two horns, two notable horns, but not just that in symbolism. Christianity at large got broken into two different sects, Catholicism, the ones that claim authority, and the other one being the Protestantism. But anyways, so the ram has taken on that. It's taking on that archetype of that growing, and it goes north, west, south. It doesn't really take over the east, the Asian people, right? But at large, it spreads all over the north, west, south. It did that. That is history. Um, it says that a goat comes from the West. The goat is what puts the ram underfoot. It takes its keys. It takes its dispensation. It gets, it puts the ram, the dispensation of Christianity under its foot. And it's interesting that the goat sign Capricorn is the sign on which Joseph Smith was born under. It was a, a foreshadowing and a prophecy of Joseph Smith. Oh, oh and he, okay. he took their keys and we'll go, Taylor, we'll go into began a little bit a more. Than, began anew. Began a new dispensation. And next slide. Um, so we're working through like what happened with Joseph Smith. Was he this dirty pedophile that everybody thought he was? Um, does, does the scriptures give a narrative on this? Does the stars give a narrative on this? Or was he a legitimate good man that was just blamed? Um, do you want to go ahead and read that scripture? Yeah. So this so is Leviticus 16. Um, Try and see if you if you hear in this any of those phrases that I've loved from some of the essays I've read, like several months before her 15th birthday and later <laughs> reminiscences are not always reliable. Try and see if you hear any of that in here. So we're talking. OK, yeah. So you are you are just so I understand this. You are kind of using Joseph's um, 
star signs. Is that the yeah, right yeah, term? Yeah. He was born on um, the sign. So Joseph's birthday, okay. December 23rd, uh, is when and the so sign you can... Capricorn, which is the goat. Okay. Just like Jesus, uh, born April 6th, is born under the sign of the lamb. Joseph was born under the sign of the goat. Okay. Okay. And so we have all those scriptures. We could read all through Leviticus about how the high priest is supposed to kill the lamb over and over and over and over and over again. And he does. And they have so much practice that by the time the lamb comes in the flesh, they they play their role exactly as prophesied. Well, we're looking kind of in the scriptures. What does it say? What happens with goats? And, okay, you know, is there something here? And so Leviticus 16 he is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. So what's interesting and in what happened in the restoration was Joseph kind of got blamed for everything. And it's in scripture, an allegory. The goat gets blamed for everything. And then there's another part, another break off, another goat, like the dispensation goes into the wilderness. It, get, it goes, and this happens in the West. If you look at the previous scripture, it's something that happens in the West. It's something that happens in America. Somebody born under the sign of the goat, they, they put the other dispensation under their feet and then they get blamed for everything. Yeah, one for the gets sins sacrificed of for the sin offering. And the other one is laden with sins and goes into the wilderness. It has the actual sins. And so, okay. So, so catch me up just a little bit. I have a couple of questions. Okay. So the, the, um, the lamb is different from the goat because the lamb is also a scapegoat. Like Jesus was also blamed for the sins of the world and crucified right. or sacrificed. Well, lamb, and so how is the goat different than the lamb? Well, the lamb was sacrificed for sin. Oh, okay. And and that was a, a, a foreshadowing to the Messiah. And then separately, the goat is an allegory towards this dispensation. And the, uh, you know, we've only put a couple of verses here, but if you read the whole chapter, like the, the ritual involving the goat is that you bring two and the high priest is going to kill one of them and is going to confess, lay on hands and confess the sins of the people of the other one and let it go into the wilderness. So okay. it's a bit of a different, uh, di different than the uh, lamb offering where you're, you know, the lamb of God is, is taking on the sins and giving his life with the goat. One gives its life and the other one takes on the sins and is let go into the wilderness. Yes. I only brought up the lamb allegory to show that that one was already fulfilled and that God prophesies that way. And then I went to this separately just to kind of show what God was prophesying about in regards to the restoration. So does that make sense? Okay. And I, I, I'll, I'll think about it more, but yes, I mean, okay. keep, keep going. I'll, I'll keep pondering and, on it. And one thing yeah. to like, no, there's two goats and the restoration split into two main factions. Okay. And, and RLDS and, and LDS. And the LDS went, the Brighamite faction went out West. And once again, it's talking about the West and the scripture before, but the one comes. Okay. To so, end. okay. Okay. All of a sudden it's clicking. And so forgive me for being slow. One gets blamed for everything. Yes. It's Joseph. And one actually does everything. Yes. yes. Right. <laughs> so, and the one that gets expelled, the one that goes out West is the one that's actually guilty. That's that has all the sins. Loaded, yeah. with sins, loaded with sins is killed and is blamed for the sins got it thank yes, you for Joseph letting me click that because that's sins. cool okay but, but the but there's also multiple allegories going on too where yeah once again mormonism two different factions one comes to an end and we're watching the rlds church come to an end basically and then there's one that's kind of continued and spread throughout the earth so okay yeah with the rlds are, recently Losing and, their properties. And okay. When we're dealing with uh, symbolism and allegory, like the temptation in our Western minds is to say one thing means one thing always. And to, to your point, you brought up symbolism related to Jesus, because this is absolutely relevant to Jesus's crucifixion as well, where Pilate presents two people, one who's actually guilty of some sins and one who is completely guiltless, Jesus. 
and they kill one of them and they let the other one go. So it's it's relevant to that too. Like there, there are layers and multiple ways to look at this that are all relevant at the same time. Okay. Right? I'm not, I'm not, in other words, I'm not telling you discard what you've heard from Sunday school about that. Cause like, no, that's good. That's a good way to, to see what this means. Well said. Okay. Okay. Revelation 12. Uh, this is a, uh, a familiar sign. It's, it's, there appeared a great wonder or sign in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun. So this is where the sun is in the sky, the moon under her feet, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. So that would be the constellation Leo plus three planets. Okay, the uh, the Revelation 12 sign show, has shown up a couple of times that are uh, relevant to that idea of a replacement covenant body. One in 2 BC, Okay, that was, and that was at the time roughly of the conception of Jesus. Okay, so it, it kind of, that this omen in the heavens heralds a new dispensation, a new covenant body where the prior covenant body is being put under feet, being displaced. And you can decide whether that's good or bad by what you choose to be part of. Okay, um, very cool. Another time this sign showed up in the heavens was in 1827, like the day that Joseph Smith got the gold plates from the angel. Okay. And there is a third time fairly recently. Do we want to talk about that now or later? Um, however. Yeah, there, there's a third time in uh, September 2017 that this sign was in the heavens as well. It's a recent phenomenon. Do you guys have an interpretation of that yet? Well... I would argue that it's always the same interpretation. It's always meant the same thing because um, number one, like the word covenant is like interchangeable with testament, right? And so when you go back to the beginning, John the Baptist and and um, um, Jesus were both in the womb at the time and they brought forth a new covenant, a new testament. And we even call it that in our scriptures, a new testament. And it, it's a symbol of that. And, and it, the idea is that the Jewish people at that time lost active covenant status, like they were like a divorced spouse. And what Jesus brought was like a new covenant. They held like he, they became the bride of Christ, right? And then once again, um, he's going to go into this prophecy now, but it's giving this star sign to prop up what he's going to say is happening in 1823 and that's going to put 1823 into context and but once again it's the idea that like a new testament a new t covenant's being offered and it's associating it with what he's going to read yeah and uh wow. okay. to, to kind of piggyback on that if you're there in that moment like try and mentally place yourself in 2 bc or in 1827 how do you recognize, okay, we see a sign in the heaven that, and say you say you understand this, that it means there's a new Testament, a new covenant. How do you recognize where that is and where you find it? You know, is it this crazy guy preaching out in the wilderness and baptizing and saying, saying to us, the Jews that are righteous and holy, that keeps the law and do the observances daily in the temple. And we're so good at it that we, we have a whole slaughterhouse. We're very efficient. We got blood everywhere. And telling us that we have to repent and that we sink. Um, mm -hmm. That guy, like, how do you recognize that? And that's, I'm not suggesting an answer to that. I'm suggesting, you know, if you are alive at the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, how would you recognize them when the authorities are all saying those people are crazy? If you're alive at the time of Joseph Smith, how would you recognize him when he's got this crazy golden Bible that no one, you know, none of the authorities respect? No one takes it seriously. How do you recognize it? And that's a pondering question. I'm not going to suggest an answer to, but. Excellent um, one. Okay. Revelation 12, and she brought forth. So this is, you know, the woman in the sky. She brought forth a man child or a young man who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And Nephi instructs us that that's the word of God. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Okay, if that's not a description of a biography of Joseph Smith as a young man being caught up to the throne of God, I don't know what is. Oh, interesting. Oh, so it doesn't necessarily mean killed. It means came into the presence of God, potentially. Right. Okay, okay. 
And the iron rod also is associated with the word of God in the Bible, too, because it says that the rod of iron comes forth out of God's mouth. And what comes out of his mouth? His words. The word of God. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, sharper than a two edged sword. It's really great imagery mm-hmm. if you're like a child trying to draw but, on the church. Or something. But once again, this <laughs> happened the same day he claims he got the gold plates because he got them at the night of September 22nd. And it happened in the morning of, the, of September 23rd. And if you look at the Hebrew day, it goes evening to evening. So therefore, it was the same Hebrew day, the way Hebrews count time. Wow. Okay. And, and so really with that cool. in mind, on the uh, on the 2017 one, I'll, I'll just tell you, like, yeah, you're living in an era where that sign has been given again. That sign has been in the heavens. Can you recognize what God's doing and how to be part of it? And how would you do that? It's the, it's the same challenge that was faced by people in Joseph Smith's day and in Jesus's day. Right. Yeah. Do you do you throw stones at Samuel the Lamanite? Do you want Abinadi burned at the stake? Do you want or can you listen to a message that comes? And I'm not yeah, claiming that it's me. I'm not the one mighty and strong. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, we could leave that aside. I think it's just a general. I don't think it's that we're looking for the one person. I think it's just a general um, um attitude i think is what we're speaking to right are we willing to hear things and consider and be humble or are we self-righteous is kind of what the question comes down to yeah are you going to reassure yourself that i keep the law and i fast twice Mm -hmm. in the week and i'm i am the most religious son of a sorry (laughs) that you've ever (laughs) seen and i'm going to be a real piece of work to deal with or are you going to be someone whose heart is right with god and who's interested in what god's doing Right. And that's what Jesus always said, too. Like everything you've heard since your infancy, then it's all good and you'll accept it. Right. But anyone, anything new we have to fight against if that's. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. part of this idea of not being defensive, not having our walls up, but being willing to consider and then and then use the tools God has given us to discern so that we don't just fight things that might be good. Call a good evil and evil good. Okay, excellent. Love okay, it. so the next part of this is when the dragon comes and uh, makes <laughs> war with the saints. We're going to talk a bit, little bit about the dragon. It's something cosmic. Um, if you see that there's a bigger star there, that's Thuban. And uh, we've associated the dragon with Draco. And this one right here. Yes. Thuban. And at one point, like at the beginning of our cycle of creation back 6,000 years ago or so, that Thuban, that alpha star of Draconis, was held the throne of God. It was the North Star and has been since thrown off the throne. Like like what we say in scriptures about Michael and the devil warring, those are literally cosmic plays getting acted out for us. Yeah, he was cast down to the earth and he drew with him, this is a graphic from earlier, but he took a third part of heaven with him. And it was also cast down to the earth. What we've got here is that same zodiacal map where I've... In the small circle, I've circled the dragon, Draco. And look, it takes four of the con- four of the 12 constellations and captures them and takes them to the fall. And it's everything from, was it Virgo to uh, Sagittarius? Sagittarius. Virgo Sag, yep. And what do those themes mean in like astro theology and astrology? Virgo's like order, organization, like church, religion. Like the, Joseph in his Joseph Smith translation associates Virgo, the woman, with the church of God. Who was the church of God? He inserts that into his into his Joseph Smith translation. And then Sagittarius is also a symbol of higher learning. It represents the sciences and, and also um, religion as well. So it, its target, what it's grabbing out, is going after people's faith, their religion, their order. That's okay. the word he holds his power that. in the sky. Okay. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. We should remember red. Red's important to this. Little red riding hood. Um, Mm -hmm. Red is a symbol of the fall. He's going to bring the fall. Um, Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Ten, we've talked about how that represents the power of God. Seven in Hebrew is Shabbat, like Sabbath. As in the Sabbath day, brings a Sabbath day, rings rest, retraction, but it's a symbol of taking away. It's a symbol of it being a destroyer also. And it's a head, it's a leader, it's a, it, it's a governing 
um, principle, um, it, that idea, that symbolism, crowning himself seven crowns, it's duplicating that meaning. Um, let's go to the next. And then the, uh, yeah. And then it says his tell drew a third part of the stars of heaven. We should break down the tell a little bit. The tell sometimes has some strong references to Scorpio and the Scorpion tell, like when it stings somebody, it, it leaves a kiss mark. And so the idea it, that it's bringing in when it brings in the idea of a tell is bringing in like the Judas Iscariot archetype. He was a betrayer. And when Jesus went through his, um, he went through a cosmic story in the new testament and his death like he went through like all the archetypes of the zodiac and when he gets kissed by judas it was a symbol of them going going through the scorpion constellation it's the betrayal that leads to death and the, scorpion, the kiss of death is a phrase is a phrase we have yeah it's that okay. and, and something we should be aware of is the scorpion rules over the taboo and one of those things that it represents is the on the cosmic body is the private parts, the reproductive organs, it, it rules over sexuality. So it's a forewarning of sexuality getting brought up. And a third okay. part of the stars of heaven are drawn away by this dragon referencing the war in heaven, but it's bringing us this, this idea of, and Joseph Smith inserts it into his Joseph Smith translation that in likeness of things that are on the earth, that's how he would, he, he yeah. put it in. And so you have the, uh, a Michael versus Satan story. You have the the Jesus being betrayed by Judas story. Like this is like you mentioned earlier. It's a pattern that happens over and over and over and over again. Yes, and then a third part. Once again, third is getting put under feet. The idea of like covenant status being removed, and also like an uncomfortable thing to talk about here is estimates is that the Brighamites let apart a third part of the saints away. Other people disagree and say it was somewhere between 30 and 50. We can't know, but really the numbers that came away to the Brighamite faction were about a third part. And it says that the dragon okay. stood before the woman, the church of God, well, which was, go ahead. Oh, just one thing that I think is useful in that third part also is that it's not necessarily saying a percentage as much as it's telling us there were three parts, right? Right, so it's, that's fair. So it's also that that's one of the big factions is the faction that came to Utah, the faction that yeah. stayed with like the three factions of the, the three main factions of the church. Okay. Right. Our, our Western minds like to think, okay, a third part, that means one divided by 33%. three. 33%. <laughs> right. Rather than group one, group two, group three, group three left. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it drew away one of the groups of one of the three groups was drawn away. Okay. Interesting. And it says that the, it was, the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for, for to devour her child as soon as it was born, like in its infancy, the child oh, is a reference yeah. to the head, um, Aries consolation. It represents an heir, like a leader that's on the earth. It's, it's like a reference to the young man, Joseph Smith, He's seeking to devour him as soon as he's born, like when it's in his infancy, the, the restoration, right? This is so. incredible because that's what people like. So the restoration is just born. It's definitely isn't matured. It's not brought to, to, wish, to fruition and immediately come in these false spirits, these false ideas, these mm -hmm. um, to, to pollute it. And then to, okay, that's profound. Wow. Okay. It gets worse. <laughs> oh, it gets worse. And, and this applies both to okay. Joseph's life. Like when he's it's, born, he gets okay. his leg infection and that was potentially okay. lethal. Like all, all of the stories that you know just from Joseph's life, it's like something had it out for him and he had to suffer even from a very young age. Goodness. Severe. But, you know, it is so also, it's not worse. It's so comforting because it's, I don't know that comforting is the right idea, but like so many people say, how could God let this happen? Why could, and it's kind of like, if it, I mean, it's literally written in the stars, according to what you guys yeah. are presenting mm -hmm. in terms of God's in charge. God's got this. This was all part of the plan. God doesn't see in time. Nothing's going sideways or it's just our job to play out our role in this and decide which the, side you're going to be on. Right, like, like to, to do the best we can and where we are planted in this in this grand saga that God's in charge of. It's all okay. Okay. That, yeah, and it's really it cool. kind of like, you know, what, what you said reminds me of in the, in the Gospels, I believe it's in the Gospel of John where Jesus says, and I'm going to totally 
butcher paraphrasing it. <laughs> but just before he's going off, like after the Last Supper, just before he's going to get betrayed and killed, he's telling them, like, I'm telling you this because I'm not going to be able to tell you while it's all happening. You know, I'm mm -hmm. going to the garden, and then I'm going to be betrayed, and then I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to die. Um, I'm telling you all this before so that you're not afraid and that you don't lose your lose your heart through all of this. So that you can have peace. Yes. Yeah. So that tell you before peace be with you. Before. Yep. Like this, there's going to be a lot of craziness, but have peace. It's okay. I've got this. Okay. So yeah. kind of the kicker, and this is, and the servant was cast, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Um, one thing to note, I put fire and water there, but like, aren't dragons supposed to breathe fire, not water? Yeah. That's weird, right? Uh -huh. Why? Um, even, even when you were researched like the fiery fi flying serpents or the ser seraphim that are the, the serpent-like creatures that are known to be at, at the throne and presence of God, they're fiery serpents, they're dragons, the true dragons, right? But this dragon is not bringing ascension to the woman. It's bringing water. And in astrology, water is deeply symbolic of sexuality. He's carrying away a flood, encompassing the woman, the church, with sexuality. And he's carrying her away that way. That's how he's overcome mm. her. And, okay, have to, okay. and and to make matters worse, it's implicating something because we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it says mouth several times in this chapter, and, and it's not a coincidence. And the mouth in, in the original Hebrew was a representation of the constellation Gemini that rules over the mouth, rules over words. And um, who was born under that sign? It's giving us a warning of men, Gemini's too born under the sign and once again one of them has red hair and and born under that sign shall we turn it okay are you ready for the big reveal of who i he's am I, I, I wanna, okay wait bit pause everyone think in your mind who you think it is we should have everyone just like hurry and write in the comments who okay. you think it will be and we'll see if we all have the same guess this is, okay this is who brian's identifying as the antichrist that's this is people about. who are this is like antichrist level prophesy prophecy is okay, your soul so prepared pause. Put your For the antichrists of this generation. Or All right, let's do okay. the reveal. Three, two, one. Both I, born under the I sign. was right. Who else was right? <laughs> Holy cow. I didn't know their birthdays. I was like, it's got to be Brigham and Heber. The besties, they're best friends from ch early childhood. And okay, I want to know everyone in the comments who was right. I'm going to be looking through after to see who got it. That's <laughs> No way. I totally <laughs> called that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I mean, all along, they're warning us of these signs. These, the scriptures are more in depth. These understanding the cosmos, our reason, my reason for pushing them has been to help people have a new thirst for their scriptures. Like it will bring them out alive again for you. Good like grief. This people ask, crazy. how can I learn this stuff more? I'm like, read your scriptures. It's in your scriptures. Yeah, read them. Read them slowly. Read them without a manual telling you what everything <laughs> means. Like, let it wash over you and do it slowly. I think Joseph Smith had something to say about careful, solemn, and ponderous thought can find out the mysteries of God. I want to go into that a little bit more. Okay. I won't steal your thunder. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll well, do that on the green. Yeah. It's uh, true, though, just the second witnesses, second and third witnesses, right? When you have additional ways to understand, it brings more power, more understanding, and more testimony to these things. That's incredible. Okay. Yeah, so there's some innuendo in the stars that kind of also implicate some other things. Um, I've, I've put Mars there because that was how the planets looked like when Joseph Smith was killed. Also, like Mars, if you flip to the next screen there, I'm going to want to flip back. All the planets, and this is in our book, The Ancient Cosmic Language, um, are all representative of the planets. Like living the commandments is the same as living in honor of the planetary energies. They're, they're the same archetypes, the same themes. And the commandment associated with Mars is thou shalt not kill. Let's go back. Oh. And then Mars, the planet of thou shalt not kill, is at Gemini. 
in the sky when Joseph died. And on top of that, this wasn't a first-hand account by Joseph, but it was reported from a talk he had given that he had asked when the second coming would be. And he says, if thou wilt live until thou art 80 and five years old, thou shalt see the face of the son of man. And Joseph gave his interpretation. He goes, I don't think it's going to happen any sooner than that time. And he was right. But then he goes, I kind of think this is a reference to when I die and see Jesus's face. And what happens is, is in the ancient cosmic language book, what characters in Hebrew those are is Mars is five and Gemini is 80. And that happens to be the alignment 80 and five when you look at it through cosmic lenses of the alignment when Joseph dies and sees his face. Is that a coincidence? What does that implicate? Um, That's up to you to decide. We'll let you guys decide that. Oh my gosh. Okay. But, need, okay. but needless, needless to say, um, and this may be pretty bold, but in the Book of Mormon, it says the last prophet, Mor Moroni takes over his first words where he's taken over the book. He says, behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know you're doing. And if the if Joseph Smith revealed a past people and, and uncovered them from the dust, and then he died behind closed doors and by a mass mob, unrevealed, whatever, right? Then if those prophetic people also saw his day, and if God is a just God, and if the Book of Mormon came from Joseph Smith, do, do not those, do they not owe it in their history to leave allegory back to what happened at that time? That's worth like noting, I would say. I mean, we have stories wow. like Malachi and all that other stuff. They, yeah. they probably should be reread through an, a lens of allegory. Yeah, read it through a lens of allegory and prophecy rather than as just Nephite history. And, it, okay. and it's not from precedence. You have both the Book of Mormon and both the Restoration start out with a young man, Prophet Nephi, Joseph Smith. They both build temples. They both get driven from place to place. The, um, then that breaks into two different factions, even though there was a whole bunch of different factions, but there was main two principal factions, Nephites and Lamanites. RLDS picked their leadership the same way that uh, um, the, 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 Lamanites. Nephites did. the Lamanites took on the archetypes of, of uh, the, how the LDS church went. And then they changed leadership in a certain specific way with the Malachi. It's, it's all worth reading again. Wow. Okay. And just while you were going over that, this scripture came to mind, and I'm sure this is not new to you guys at all, but I just want to share it because um, it just applies to me to what we're talking about. Doctrine and Covenants 3, it starts at the beginning. The works and the designs and the purposes of God cannot be frustrated, neither can they come to not, for God does not walk in crooked paths. I'm just thinking of how you were describing, Angela, the path of the sun that Jesus Mm -hmm. stayed within right and for god doth not walk in crooked paths neither doth he turn to the right hand nor to the left neither doth he vary from that which he hath said therefore his paths are straight and his course is one eternal round this is so applicable to what we're talking about yeah. remember remember that it is not the work of god that is frustrated but the work of men and it goes on from there but that just hit me in the context of everything we're talking about that God's got this. It was all, it's, God does not walk in crooked paths. It's not, things aren't being messed up from what, God, you know, God's not trying to go, oh no, now what, I guess is what, what the point is. It's it's God, you're doing that. <laughs> like, shoot, how did they mess up the restoration and kill my prophet? And now what do I do? Right? It's, it's if anything, all, I kind of, I had this image of God being like, wait a minute. Uh, Gabriel, they repented, so uh, cancel that destruction we had scheduled. Yeah. <laughs> I well, have that as a surprise if you get a surprise God. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I think this is profound. Okay, very cool. I love this. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to go to the next one. Will you? Uh, yeah, challenge. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess you know the the main message we want to get to and. And I, I like having it on this screen when I think about this. You know, we, we talked about fire and water, uh, fire ascending to God, uh, filling yourself, 
filling your life with the spirit of God, with spirituality, with goodness versus being overcome by a flood of sexuality. I think that's a pretty good description for our modern world. Um, There's also the Baptist. It reminds me just of the baptism as well, right? The baptism of water that washes away sin as well. Like baptism is yeah. the is the lower, and then and then the baptism of fire that's the higher that fills us with the Holy Ghost. First, you, you yeah. know, it's it's an interesting um, dichotomy. Okay. Yeah, and and so like with with that in mind, and and with what I said earlier about the Revelations twelve sign, like you're living in an era where that sign's been given, and you get to make a choice of where you're going to find yourself. Are you going to be part of a covenant body that's being displaced? Are you going to be part of whatever it's being displaced with? Are you going to be interested and humble in whatever God it is doing, whatever God is doing? Or are you going to be recalcitrant and stuck in, you know, your knowledge that you're right and you've always been right and that no one ever else has been right but you? That's up to you to decide, dear listener, dear audience member. And that's that was the challenge we wanted to leave on this. Yeah, the idea that like light is rising. There's a time right now where the secrets are being uncovered. You've been a part of that. Um, we would love to be a part of it too. And and let's not get chased out into the wilderness again. Let's create something better. Like the scriptures say that we're supposed to create Zion. We're supposed to do better things. Let's like so. We'd like to challenge people to hang on and go to the light and not to make the mistakes of the past, not to just go through these cycles again. When you go through the whole path of the sun, the, the, the Lamb of God is where it all starts, where life comes from. And you go all the way around. And then when you get to the last constellation, it's Pisces. Pisces is the fish and it's of the moving waters. And the fish has two different paths. One goes to the other cycles, like a repeating cycle. And the other upper fish points to the throne of God in the sky. It's a symbol of the ascent. Let's choose that path. If we could plead to any, 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 to everybody, let's choose this path together. Let's ascend. Let's do it right this time and not fall into the traps of the past. From what I'm hearing, the way that we kind of ride this tide upward, that we let the waters be the waters of baptism rather than the the flood of sexuality or the right uh, how we let the baptism of fire come instead of being burned at the last day is yeah, just about right. our hearts being open and humble and seeking God rather than our traditions. Is this, am I hearing correctly how you are interpreting that? Yes. And one thing to kind of clarify is, um, <laughs> this is like really bratty, but like Sagittarius is the constellation in which the sun passes. It's a symbol of religion. And, and, and one of the themes it uses to describe that constellation, one of the older themes of it is not just being an arrow, but also being a great and spacious building or a tower. And it's a symbol okay. of higher learning, the sciences, religion, and, and those orders of things. And it's actually a root. The next constellation, Capricorn, also can be seen, can be seen as the father, but can also be seen as the devil. Um, it takes you, religion takes you to the devil, <laughs> but when you go to the, the upper part, or, oh, yeah, oh, the go upper ahead. part Pisces is, is different than religion. It's square. It's 90 degrees with religion. They're both mutable. And Pisces is a representation of spirituality. It's spirituality. It's the heavens that take you to the other plane. So that's the key okay. there is, is connecting the spirituality to heaven, to God. It's, it's what we put our trust in, what our hearts are turned toward and what our reliance is on. And if I think that if our reliance is on a religious structure, then we are stuck, right? That The Book of Mormon t teaches these lessons and it takes us the wrong direction into the chains of hell. As when we say enough of the word of God, we have enough and we need no more of the word of God. And we settle for the lesser portion as Alma talks about, that is the chains of hell. Whereas when the same thing, I like that it's either the building or the arrow, right? Knowledge and insight and truth can either enslave us, capture us because we refuse to receive any more because what we have is sufficient, or it can continue to be poured out to take us to God. I think it's cool that those those things lead either to the Father or to the devil, like you said, with Capricorn, and that, yeah. that you know, we can choose how we receive it. If I'm understanding it correctly, that's what it means to yeah. me. And I yes. 
I think that's it, it, and we, that we don't mean that as a blanket like attack on religion. I mean religion no, it's just, can offer community, but it's it's God that saves. We want to accentuate the point that God, the Pisces constellation, what that is a symbol of, is what saves. It's it's not yeah. All of those things can be used as either opportunities or built into prisons. Every, every single one of those institutions. Mm -hmm can do that either mm -hmm. to us or for us, depending on how we approach it. Right. Okay, so. Okay, let's get onto the bonus content. This is- let's bonus content. Let's start with Joseph. So the question here, we, we've got natal charts here, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, who more likely practiced polygamy? This is, you know, put on your astrologer hat for a yep. minute. <laughs> We're gonna have fun here. And uh, yeah, let's start with like, I guess the, the first question that I think should probably be dealt with is, you know, we talked about birthplace or date, time and place, right? Can, uh, can I interrupt to... really quickly one more second and just throw in, I think that you are acknowledging this part is more just for fun, right? Because yeah, there so... can be anyone with these exact same, you can't Correct. look at someone's chart and say they're good, they're evil, they're this, Correct. they're this, right? So, Correct. so everything like, has Brigham a Young has some things in common with Jesus and, uh, and with Brian here. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's, it's, it's proclivity and it's, it's, what, what your choices are are going to be what you what you do not uh it's not we're not fatalistic okay. telling you like this is immutably what you were it's influence brigham you were destined yeah. to be a real piece of work like we're not okay saying and that. it's what we're reading into it as well as what we're, we're bringing to it of course, okay. we have the benefit right. of hindsight here yes and, right. and one nuance approach we want to play we want to play a little bit of a if i was the devil how would i tempt either of these men because certain oh, people oh, have it. certain weaknesses over others and but and that is real like so, so this first question. Very cool. You know, we're we're making some claims about uh, rising signs that de that is dependent upon time. Where do we come up with these times? Um, it's one of the highest levels of astrology, but we were reverse doing reverse astrology on him. We, we, if you can understand their 10th house, for example, you know what type of work they did, what type of careers they had, you, and you can start to like shift it around. And, and knowing their personality, you can finally like find it like, okay, what was happening? What happened to them? And if you can get enough points to triangulate, which we did with both of them, we're not going to bore you with all that, but we did a lot of work to, to hash these yeah. out and get them pretty close to and the so, minute they were born. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to say that to say, cause we're saying Joseph born at 22, 17, 47. There is no historical source that I'm aware of that says that that That's is. True us working the problem backwards and arriving at that conclusion. And same with Brigham Young. I just want to be really clear about that so that no one says, write it, carve it in the stone plates. Stone plates, that'd be heavy. I, <laughs> this I, is the time. I think we are pretty close though. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, think it was just want to get about where it came from and how Okay. I'd be curious to see, and maybe I'll put this out there. If there's someone who um, disagrees with, um, like, like who thinks that Joseph was um, was this bad guy that's described in the CES letter? It'd be interesting to see what they come up with too. But I, but this is the version I'm very interested in because I think this is what the evidence strongly points towards. So yeah, let's. This this is hey, really. Let's cool. talk about Joseph I, Smith. Capricorn Gemini rising. Uh, that's what we got him as. Uh, Gemini rising is a little bit more jovial. They're going to be talking with their hands a little bit more than regular people. Um, like playful. Yeah, Gemini rising people are fun. They're, they can be easy to talk to, like easy to talk in front of a crowd. Like they're not intimidated by that. They'll, they'll, they'll talk a lot. Like talking is a big part of their world as opposed to being, you know, shy and quiet. Joseph was, was naturally pretty mm -hmm. cheerful. Native cheery Stick times with the little boys and people thinking he wasn't a prophet because he was he was too fun. Yeah, because yeah. he would play too much, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and so I, I want to put I want to look at uh, his fifth house right here where my mouse is. So that's the cusp of the fifth house is Libra. Now Libra is the constellation that's associated with the partner, the companion, the your literal like counterpart. Um, and the fifth house is the house associated with romance. So okay. this is his hard, hard wiring. Like his wiring is to view romance as like my one and only. Like it would surprise me if teenage Joseph was 
dating girls left and right. It would surprise me, honestly, if he dated anyone other than Emma ever. <laughs> yeah. So, um, he was a romantic looking for his life partner. Yeah, well, he, yeah. he associates, Fifth House is romance, right. and it's associated with a partner. So for somebody mm -hmm. like that to cheat, they have to uh, disassociate with not wanting their partner anymore before they're going to be even entertaining that. It, it, that and on of, top of it, sign in the seventh house. Seventh house is the other place you look for where you see the partner, right? And his son, like his his life force, his ego, like is tied up in there too. So anyway, to, yeah. not, not to cut you off, but for someone like that to betray that trust or to cheat, like you would have to have a really severe separation from... So, so yeah. what I'm hearing is that it wouldn't, if Joseph were to be unfaithful to Emma, it would be, you're no longer the one I'm, I, it would be a replacement yeah. with someone else that yeah. he felt that yeah. like, he's looking for that partnership. He's not looking to get some action. He's not right. Uh, it's he okay. associates that action with a partner. And, and you know, there, there's a few people we know that have similar wiring. Um, Whitney Horning is one who, also, Gemini Rising, if we can reveal You that could thing. ask her if she wanted to sleep with a bunch of guys and she would be like, that, that's disgusting. That's the worst idea ever. You know what I mean? It would be the worst idea yeah. ever. Um, like, she ha he has the same wiring as Whitney Horning that way. Okay. And, and I, I'm Whitney? married to someone <laughs> with really similar wiring as well. My dear wife, also that way, and she would say the same I, thing. Oh, I've asked her because I was <laughs> researching for this. And I got like, <laughs> <laughs> I got like a scowl. <laughs> Okay. So that, that's kind of what we're seeing in just anything else you want to talk about? With yeah, that? yes. Let me explain the seventh house a little more. When you see the houses, it's not their personalities as much as their interests. So at the core of his ego, his interest is in his spouse, his partner. That's the partner energy. So he would have been really into his partnerships, whether it be Cindy Rigdon and Hiram Smith. Like he, he's a guy that has really close one-on-one -on -one friends, whether with Emma, his brother Hiram, at a time Sidney Rigdon, at a time Oliver Cowdery, but he's not one as who a, has- As a like, boy, his his older brother, Alvin, he, like there was that one person that Emma sort of replaced as the one he had, like God told him, you have to take one person with you to get the plates. And that would be that partner, right? And yeah. so that's, and, and I like how Don Bradley pointed out the parallel revelations to um, Joseph and Emma that go side by side in the Doctrine and Covenants and have so many similarities. That's another testimony of this idea of kind of perfect partnership. Okay, very cool. I love this. You've got Mars right here in the seventh house. That's Mar Mars is often connected to sex drive. So that's, again, it's what he's attracted to. As he's a spouse. attracted to. His he, spouse. he wants it, time with the spouse, not other things, you know. He doesn't have a roving eye. Okay, a wandering eye. Yeah, it's eye. not a roving eye. And their earth, earth is like one of the least sexual too. Like it's very grounded. It's, in fact, if I, if, if you're the devil, how would you attempt him? Okay. So this is a game Brian and I play sometimes. <laughs> if I was the devil, how would I tempt you? Um, I look at uh, second house right here for him. He's got that earth symbol here. Second house is money. If I were the devil, how oh. would I tempt Joseph? I'd offer him gold. I'd offer him riches. I'd offer him. And, you know, when, as soon as I said that to Brian, you know, a couple of days ago when we were talking about this, I thought, oh, wait, that's exactly what he even admitted to being tempted by the first time he saw the plates. Like, ooh. Like, right. that's where I would, if I were the devil and I wanted to tempt Joseph, that's the avenue that I'd be going with. He has so much Capricorn and Aquarius energy. He's going to be so offended and wanting to cancel anybody that's being inappropriate that way. That's not his issue. If if he's going to be, if he was weak anywhere, it was with money, not with sexuality. And it took several years of discipline and instruction before uh, the angel, sometimes identified as Moroni, sometimes identified as Nephi and whatever you think, before the angel said, yeah, okay, take the plates and don't screw it up. <laughs> and even then, you can tell me if I'm reading into this, but Joseph actually just was never good with money, right? Like, like it was yeah. almost like um, he he had to just write it off and be like, "I'm he too. This is too much of a temptation." Right, right. Like the whole, like it's almost like I I can't I can't 
the handle the bills, the debts, the, any of that. I don't want to have to mess with it because it's, it's too much of a temptation. I don't, maybe I'm reading that in, but it's, I can kind of relate to having areas like that where it's like, I, this is a weakness. I'm going to want. Anyway, that's really yeah. interesting. He, he admits it though. Like he was yeah. on with his chart, with his personality profile that we have. He was honest with us. So I, I expect himself. honesty in the other okay. areas. Like I wouldn't even waste But even time. to where he learned that lesson of not wanting money so much that God had to tell him, hey, it's okay. You're worthy of your hire for the work you're doing of translation and the work you're doing, right? Like he had to, anyway, he almost had to sign a vow, vow of poverty, poverty to some extent at times in his life, it seems. Yeah, so, well, okay, that's that, really uh, interesting. Yeah, you know, there's, there's the forgotten brother of the restoration. My great grandfather Samuel who was often the practical one who would like okay Joseph and Hiram are working on stuff for church I'm going to figure out how to do some farming and and provide for all of us and, okay you know that was that was more his role and all that um anything else we want to say about Joseph we, we, we yeah I, there's a lot about him for you want us to talk I, you want us to move to bring I think him there's out. some really important no, things keep going you know, keep telling us about Joseph Joseph. Yeah. um Jupiter is what you expand it's your blessing it's what you you're like what's going to flow and grow for you that lands into Sagittarius six house. Once again, Sagittarius is a religion. Six make us, makes it organized religion. It shows that he had an omen of organized religion um, in his chart showing that like he would grow that. And on top of that, I know you said, you want to say it? No, <laughs> the Jupiter talisman? Oh. There is, that, that's not fully documented the best. It doesn't come from the most reliable source. But Jupiter, it was said by what Joseph Smith's wife, Emma's second husband, said that he had a Jupiter talisman. Lewis and that uh -huh. comes from like Michael D. Quinn, right? Not fully verifiable, but Jupiter's in its home, constellation Sagittarius when he was born. So... That's a quite the coincidence. So I kind of put that in the, you know, maybe category, but. Uh, yep. Uh, and Joseph us. wouldn't. I think one of the things that turns people off about that is, oh, no, it's this. It's exactly what we're talking about. Joseph wouldn't have known about that or done that. And I think that that that's an assumption that we're not necessarily safe to make. Yeah. So it's interesting. Well, like they call it okay. magical thinking and stuff. And back then, like, that's just how people thought and how people talked and mm -hmm. what people like. So we're not scared of that. And I'm not taking a position right. one way or the other on whether we had the talisman or not, but you know, maybe. Okay. And but the Luke, thing about Jupiter being in his, in his area where he would create, I mean, organized yeah. religion is power. That's profound. Okay. Yeah. And that shows that omen. And that's another reason why we think, think we got his thing right. Cause we knew about Sagittarius, but the way you shift as Gemini, we were able to line that up and it looks like that's what he did. Um, Saturn, Saturn's like his punishment and it's in the fifth house. That's shows that his, uh, some of his downfall, what goes against him is how well he's known. Fifth house is also like drama, like drama caused him problems. People's passion caused him problems. And so it shows that, that only being known for, for good, his name being had for good and evil being getting these bad reputations. And, yeah, and yet people. another reason I look at him and say, not like. It would surprise me if he seriously dated more than one person ever, really. Because it does show like, almost like a retraction in that area for him where he got taken away from some of his romance with um, Emma when he would be going to jail or fleeing or being hidden. Um, it shows that 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 theme showed up in his life. Um, we may need to go into something a little bit dark and omen on his chart that was kind of like... I guess could see, be seen as a cursing, um, but we for sure should go to the next slide first to kind of explain it. I, we did this recreation. Um, this is the Zodiac that was found in Dendera, Egypt. Napoleon came across it, said, cut it out of the ceiling. I want it back in France. He cut it out, took it back in France. We've had scholars and stuff look at it since and in the museum, they have been able to identify the five moving planets and they're not in their home constellation, which is interesting. That's which, which would we would expect if this was astrology, right? But instead it's something much darker that's been inscribed there. And that is 
the exaltations, which are known more as planetary magic. It is these themes inscri inscribed here of how the elites control the world. They understand these themes, They under and these themes are how our subconscious has wiring. And we're not going to give a full discourse on this. We go into some of this stuff on our channel. Um, but like, these are the themes that get you to vote for people, get you to spend money, get you to go so to So this movies. is the dark side. This is yeah. the dark side of using this knowledge to try to control others. This is the unrighteous dominion piece of it. It can be, it, it, it can be used that it's way. It's greatly right. used that way. And it often is, yeah. And, um, and for example, like you see a movie like Twilight where it gets like a cult following. They use like three planetary exaltations in their themes. They're writing movies and stories off of these. That's how you get people to show up. And if you do it out of place and you're not using those stories, people aren't interested. These are like magnets, oh, these okay. themes. Like we're I all see, like okay. controlled and manipulated by these themes. But needless to say, one of them is Saturn in Libra. And where, where Libra hits the path of the sun, um, it's where the fall is. And you put what you do is the math behind this is they take the ruling planet of Capricorn, the darkest day of the year, and they place it to where it's like in this, has this like fulcrum movement where they put the ruling of planet where it goes, where it's a little ahead of where it goes. And there's like this momentum that it causes like an energetic whip. And Saturn and Libra is like the Romeo and Juliet story. It's the, it's like the cursing of like, we're going to plague you. You're the couple that's in love, but you can't be together. Yeah. It, it, but it's, but it's also about reputation. This is used that planetary alignment that is used is the theme that like curses people and slanders them about their relationships, whether it be true or not. It is oh, the theme wow. of that, like the idea that of somebody's running for political office and then you make a sexual all all allegation against them. He has that omen in his chart showing the, that that downfall, that sexual allegation. So, um, oh, my gosh, which defines his life, those accusations. But, but it's not just about the wife. It's about the partner. It's like a retractionary force that's cursed with all the people that claim to be his partners. Think about all the people that fell away from him. That was John Bennett, Cuba. William Law, all of the people who betrayed him, uh, Brigham Young. And like, like, so William his Clayton. curses, William. Oh yeah. Just again and again and again, he was. It shows that omen and curse on his life. Oh my goodness. He's cursed when it comes to partnerships. Like, like, in fact, he did it incredibly well staying married with that kind of alignment. And usually if people have that alignment. They're going to get a divorce. But he had re retraction, like even like with trying to get with Emma, the, the dad got in the way. Yeah. Like, he didn't like that. And Saturn's big daddy. It's big daddy punishing you. And, so, and then, like you said, him him being so often taken away and then and then ultimately killed and taken away while she was still expecting. So maybe in a way, and I won't remember, you'll have to remind me, but was it Libra, the things that made him so loyal in partnership and look and in romance kind of counterbalance that cursing when it came to Emma to make mm -hmm. it so that they could because because Joseph and Emma really it seems to me relied on each other needed each other and with Hiram he was he had a good faithful relationship so, there but there were so many challenges elsewhere yes one thing to clarify is is when we're talking about Saturn we're not talking about personality we're talking about an omen that has is like an energetic right core. Everything else that you were talking about to clarify is it was his personality. His personality was to be loyal, to be faithful, to to he okay. has a natural flow that way is how he feels inside. Um, but yeah, this has a lot of omens in it, like Pluto in Pisces it shows a transformation of uh, spirituality in his um, time in his generation, which clearly happened. Um, it, uh, Anyways, has quite a yeah. Quite we got a uh, we got Mercury in Aquarius. That's somebody who can talk and talk and talk all day and can give a long discourse <laughs> and talk about religion in ninth house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, okay. Um, he's got Venus and uh, Mercury and Venus there. Yeah. Yeah. So he he loved to talk about religion, higher learning, higher understanding. Moon Moon there too, but Moon in Aquarius is very like it's the opposite of Leo. So Leo energy is romance, right? And where you see the lion energy, it wants to flirt and and be romantic. He has the opposition there. He has the opposite energy of 
of that in that place. And it's more about his emotions are more for wanting it to be appropriate. Yeah. Aqu Aquarius is about appropriateness, about humanitarianism, doing so, the right thing. Not, not to disparage uh, Brother Joseph here, but kind of a prude, um, at least a little bit. <laughs> okay. So for him, all of these accusations, if you, when you read his words, if you're not coming to it just knowing he's lying, it's almost like, this is so stupid. This is like, he yeah. just, he, he's just like, this is so stupid. People keep saying this and it's so stupid, which is how he would have seen it. He didn't have any guilt or concern. He was just like, right. it's not worth talking. Like the girl business when it came to Fanny Alger or the, because even the betrayal happened with Oliver Cowdery and like it happened again and again and again. And he, I can see now why his attitude is like, oh my gosh, come on. Because it wasn't even a temptation for him. It wasn't even on the table. It was the furthest thing you could possibly, that was on his mind. Okay, wow. Okay, so I'm going to bring so in one, cool. just to kind of help people. I don't know if we've said celebrities that are kind of like these people, but uh, Glenn Beck has the same sun and rising as Joseph Smith. <laughs> so expect a little more of that personality. And then Brigham Young, who did Brigham Young match? <laughs> so Brigham Young uh, has a very similar makeup as everyone's favorite president. I was going to say, was like Donald Trump? Trump? <laughs> I thought you... Whether he's your favorite president to abuse or your favorite president to hate, he's still your favorite. Okay. <laughs> and I would could say that um, Donald Trump isn't the loyal, faithful husband type. Okay. Well, whatever his strengths are elsewhere, that's not one of them. I think it's safe to say. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're wired the same there. Leo um, gets yeah, the house to romance. Um, fifth that's house right. aligned with Sagittarius. Sagittarius is the biggest, most explosive fire. And that's what um, is associated with his romantic like flow. And not only that, the fifth house is aligned with religion. He, he's got him. He's wired to make it about religion. If he's going to be so for romantic. him, religion and sex and like glory would all go yeah, together. He's associated those correctly? two together. In those, his those would in fit his in, in his mind. Okay, that's what. That would, that those wow. fit like Cinderella's slipper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. This is amazing. Okay. Um, Anything else we need to know about Brigham Young? Yeah, the sun was in Gemini. That can be a little. Um, these have really good and bad archetypes, but it can be talkative. And we saw that he 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 would have liked to talk. He could, and he he could also speak. Talking. Yeah, he would have had the best words. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but but also it can be a little bit of a two faced trickster. Like there is like a there's some polling, and sometimes Gemini will come out uh, as the the most hated out of the zodiac signs on polls. It, but a lot of that comes from people that were trying to date one, and they they would play them like they're interested get something out of them and not not commit so it's one of those well, archetypes that can be friendly and playful even if they're mad okay so the trickster also you could do things like signing statements against polygamy while you're secretly practicing polygamy totally. right you can yeah. like that two-faced because we have brigham on record doing that repeatedly where Joseph would be much more sincere. Brigham's the one that could say one thing and do another and put up a false front, according Correct. to that. We do need to talk about okay. his Mars, though. His Mars placement. Mars and Cancer, oh boy. That's about as, like, I'm just going to say, can I, how, how blunt can I speak on here? We'll well, for you. You no, give it a try. It's just, as, it's like the one of the horniest signs you could get. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. his, oh, Mars, his Mars where he's like sexual his sexual attraction but not just that cancer's the home it's not the type that like if it was in Scorpio it may want to just sleep around and say goodbye or or Pisces may do that just live out a fantasy and then go back home but he brings his attraction what he is sleeping around into his home like he wants to make them a part of his home. It's he's wired for polygamy. If anybody was going to be attempted wow. by polygamy, it's Mars and Cancer with a Leo. With a Leo rising. Leo rising because you place the fifth house in Sagittarius. That is like so he has a wandering. If I was the devil, I would tempt him with polygamy. If I saw somebody without alignment, I would be polygamy, polygamy. It would be like how I would do it. It was the perfect way. 
for the devil understanding a natal chart to tempt somebody. Not only that, Cancer at 28 degrees, that's the third decan. That's bigger. Third decan people like want to connect with everybody. It's it, like, and it could, there, there's healthy ways of flowing with that energy. And you probably see ladies at church where they just want to hug everybody. It can be fulfilled that way. But sometimes people use it that way where they want to just go all the way with everyone. And if you had a very high sexual appetite and you were had a roving eye and you also wanted to connect with everyone and it got connected to religion and glory and this fulfilled like this is this is exactly the chart you would make for someone who would institute it's a recipe for, in for a falling new... for that kind of deception yes and not only that the mars is in the 11th house where it puts the interests of that sexual energy with 11th house is people he has interests of okay. sexuality with people with a lot of people because 11th 11th is magnification for example um the waters aquarius is associated in the Hebrew language with the character Mame in Hebrew. And we still put, even in modern Hebrew today, we put Mame on the end of a, a word, Elohim, uh, or, or whatever else. To, Nephilim, to, Nephilim, to make it plural. That is their S. You put the plurality of everything on his sexual attraction when you put him in the 11th house, because that is that is what that means. It means people, plural, I want a lot of it. He's wired to to do that. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Okay, I'm curious at how, um, what you can see, I don't know what house it is that's kind of about abundance or how you look at money or wealth, or is there anything there for him mm -hmm. or not Not very much in this alignment? Yeah, he's got uh, Uranus. So the two I'm looking at is what's what he has placed in Taurus and what he has in his second house. Those are the two that I, two places I'm looking at. And Uranus is in second house, as well as his uh, his Earth sign right here. So that that would be like a blessing of like, yeah, money comes easily to you. He has a fortune on that on Taurus on abundance. So um, he's going to be the wealthiest man. Okay. Yeah, and okay. you got you got Uranus there um, in the second house too, like as he said, and it's also with Virgo. So which it was at that time, it moved slowly. Um, yeah, that would be a good omen for somebody that had money. Like that, that would be somebody who gets money in ways that maybe some of us don't really approve of, like extracting it from the widow's might. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And making big deals with... Um, North Node's worth um, pointing out, that's karmatic lesson. That's what you are meant to learn in this life. And it's right in the eighth house of sexuality. Whoa. That's what you're supposed to overcome. So he, this life was an opportunity for him to overcome. Like this could have been, if this, this could have been his battle that he grew from if he overcame all of these sexual proclivities instead of using religion to dive right into them. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. And, um, and so there's always mean everybody who has that as a dirtbag because I have that too. <laughs> okay. One other note, his omens, Jupiter and Saturn, we'd normally talk about these separately, like because one's expansion, one's a blessing, one's a cursing. He got them both in the same house, doubly, both in Leo, both in the 12th house. So his what he expands at is his passion, but it's also his traction, his downfall. And it's also in the 12th house, which would be usually an omen of uh, spirituality. But also it brings in the idea of illusions, like your illusions are what bring, are bringing destruction to. So your addictions can, is another archetype or theme that that could represent. So that clearly is that Leo. And what Leo it's, it's we're Leo. coming up in a Saturn return right now. In <laughs> honor of his Saturn return, it's when the destroying angel visits Brigham again. We're visiting him and, and revealing the truth about him. And that's, a few years early, but you know. Just yeah. in time. Well, oh, yeah. It, I'm thinking 12th house there. Okay. We're in 12th house because we're in Pisces now. Yeah. So that's not the same. Not quite. Scratch but it's that. good to see. It's good to give it, have an idea of when that could like really take off, right? Because our yeah. movement is growing fast. It's still not very big yet. So we'll see what happens. If I'm being like snarky about it, I'd say, oh, you're, you're somebody who like doesn't connect to God easily, Brigham Young. You're somebody who like 
doesn't hear the still small voice. Doesn't. You're a Yankee guesser. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're not gifted in that in that particular way. Not not to say that it's beyond you, but it's just it's one of those things that'll be challenging and you'll have to work for. And do you know what's interesting about that? Saturn. It, oh, okay. It makes sense why he would undervalue that then, why he would devalue it. Like when he was building the temple and he kept saying, I don't need a revelation. We've already seen it done. Revelation is for people who don't know what they're doing. I know what I'm doing. That would fit really yeah. well. Wow. Ooh. This guy. <laughs> Anything else you want to say about Brigham? <laughs> <laughs> South no Libra. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. I will say this was fun. This was cool to see how um, how much this can reveal to us about these people. And if again, if someone wants to like work up a different time of day that they think makes more sense, it needs to at least match this one for consistency and for giving us this much information. Because I think this, like like you've sold me on it. This is amazing. Yeah, the, this is something we practiced before. They're not our first experiments on reworking their stuff. And there are certain things that just align over and over and over again. And mathematically, it becomes much more of a probability when you find this many hits to the things that we can verify mm -hmm. that, that it fills in the holes of the things that but, we you may know, not know. But if someone uncovers a uh, an accurate, historical, contemporaneous record where Lucy wrote in her journal, Joseph was born at this... Hey, I'm interested. I'm I'm very interested. Let's take a look at that. I think it's at six o'clock more. I think it's more six. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we'll keep playing with it and cleaning it up. But it is fascinating to see this. I think the thing that's important to recognize is you can't just make it up. You can't just say, let's put this here and this here. Like you have to go with, we have this day and there are these possible alignments within this day. Which one gives us the most comprehensive picture of this person that we know all of these things about? Yeah. Right. And, and for example, like on their careers, they both have 10th houses and that's where their career is. And we know that like Brigham did do some building. He had some He's carpenters. Carpenter. Build. That, that, that's that alignment. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why we'd line that up. And then Joseph Smith was his 10th houses in Pisces you know, on what we have. And the Pisces themes are the spiritual world for their career. He was paid at one point for being a prophet, seer, and a lit revelator. He was um, paid to help people find stuff that was missing. Yes. <laughs> and allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> and you know what? Can I just say also people use that against him, but with what you're pointing out, that would fit so well with his chart. His weakness was, a, was, was money, right? Wanting to use his spiritual gifts to get money was one of his weaknesses that he had to overcome throughout his life that he yeah. dealt with earlier. That's really was, interesting how well that fits. He was wired to associate his spirituality with his career. And mm -hmm. one in 12 people are gonna have that. And and I wanna, I wanna also point out that it's not like he, um, cause people could use that to fight to say, see, he just was in it for the money. That's not what it is at all because he died in, in bankruptcy court, his wife, his widow was left with so many debts and Brigham Young had all of the money and took it all and left Emma with all of the debts. And Joseph actually never lived anything like in the lap of, lap of luxury at all. Yeah, I mean, all that time in jail would be kind of uh, against that. <laughs> <laughs> right. But even still, if you look at the little houses that he lived in, or even when he lived in the mansion house, when they built that, they lived in one small portion of it, and they spent all of their time caring for all of the people moving. It was always packed, slammed. They they worked hard and went without a lot. Indeed. Well, anything else we want to talk about while we're here? Well, I think this is incredible. This was so so enlightening and so much fun. And I really am curious to hear what other people would want to add to this or other insights they have. Like, it'll be interesting to see how Angela um, resonates with this, if she has changes to make to it. But I think that this is just amazing and fascinating. And I think you've given us more tools to help understand these two men, as well as all of the other things that you've that you've been showing us. It's just another tool to add to it. Thank you so much for doing this, you guys. Thanks this was an incredible presentation. I, again, just loved it. So again, it's Ancient Cosmic Clock. I do really recommend that long hour and a half discussion you have 
to just kind of help people get their feet a little bit more wet to understand what it, you're talking about with houses and signs and the different, it's, it's fun to start to try to wrap your head around it a little bit more. So. But was that the video we recorded at like midnight at my house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. We recorded a few of them at midnight, but that the idea of that is to help people like get a basic understanding of it all. And it could help them number one, start seeing it all together in scripture, or it could help them, start looking at charts like this and doing a basic reading by referencing that chart. And you can read yourself without having to pay somebody and, you know, make yeah. your, make you independent and able, capable on your own. And we, we got requests to make a poster of that and post it on Etsy so that people could order it if they wanted a big poster on their wall. But we also put it and we put it sideways so people could screenshot it and get a digital, digi digital copy for free. So we're trying to be helpful that way and just trying to be helpful to people like starting to adopt and learn these things and see things through different eyes. That's great. Well, send me any links that we'll put in the descriptions for people that sure. want to see those things that for anyone that does feel drawn to this, because I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's fascinating. And um, I, I just think it's cool. So <laughs> thank you again, you guys. It's been so fun to talk to you. And I'm sure we will talk again. Likewise. Indeed. See you soon. Another huge thank you to Brian, Taylor, and Angela for the time they put into that beautiful presentation. I just love their graphics and their expertise in these different areas that I haven't yet fully delved into. So I think it is really fun to expand our arsenal of ways to know. So thank you again to them and thank you to each of you for joining me and I will see you next time.